<clears throat> Hallelujah, find the glory, revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. In this short study, we're going to talk about the two missions of Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah, both flocks. Us being the church, so, so often, you know, we try to focus on the New Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we don't spend enough time in the Old Testament. And when you do spend enough time in the Old Testament, in addition to the New Testament, what you find out is, if you want to understand something that's in the New Testament, there are New Testament verses that will shed light on the meaning of those verses. But if you want the full, complete meaning of the verses you find in the New Testament, you go, after you're done reading that passage, that chapter, the chapter before and the chapter after, uh, of, of wherever you're at in your studies of the New Testament, now you take the extra time to go find the same subject in the Old Testament, and you get tenfold the amount of understanding. This particular short study on the two missions of Jesus Christ the Messiah is going to be a great example. When we get about halfway through this short study, you're going to see a great example of how you can get a partial meaning of a verse in the New Testament by reading the whole chapter. But if you find a match to it in the Old Testament, then you end up with tenfold the amount of understanding of that New Testament verse. That happens all the time in the Bible. They're supposed to go together. You know, decades ago, there was this uh, push to make New Testament uh, books of the Bible to publish them all by themselves. You know, hard copies of the New Testament without the Old Testament. What was that all about? You know, well, they wanted to make it small and just make sure you had at least the New Testament that you something you could put into your jacket pocket. Uh, excuse me. Why in the world? That to me just sounds like the work of Satan. It really does because if you want to understand the New Testament, you go to the Old Testament, and this is a great example of that. Now, on that subject of what you're going to see when we get halfway through this short study on the two missions of Jesus Christ, you're going to see in this short study that we find a verse in the Old Testament that not only helps our meaning of the New Testament verse, but it is a powerhouse verse. It's one of those verses that gives understanding to a, to a question that if you were to ask that question to the church, if you were asked that question, if you were to ask that question to anyone on the planet, um, less than 0.01% of followers of Jesus Christ could have told you the answer to that question. This is one of those golden nuggets, right? One of those precious truths that are, aren't found by Bible readers and teachers. They're not. It's been there the whole time. Again, people just read over stuff, and they don't realize, wipe it off a little bit. You just found gold, and you're going to know things that most people who have ever lived, like 99.99% .99 of people who ever lived, never knew that was in the Holy Word, never saw it, never had its understanding, but yet it's been there the whole time. Okay? You're going to see it when we get halfway through this study. Uh, I've got some passages here for you in Isaiah 49, Ephesians 5, Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 6, Acts 26, and starring Malachi chapter 1. As with a lot of these short studies that I do, it just so happens that the verses being used a lot of times will have the same numbers in them. Okay? In this particular study, you're going to see the numbers 5 and 6 used a lot by the Word of God. And like I always say, I don't think it's ever a, um, what's the word, 
a uh, coincidence when these happen. I think sometimes they just help give understanding. It's the Word of God doing it on purpose to help give understanding to say, you're right, you think that should be matched up with that? Look at the numbers, and yes, it should be. All right. I, I've, I've seen that happen hundreds of times in my studies, and this is another example. I'm not going to take that any deeper and try to make anything else out of it. The number five always means this. The number six always means this. No, I'm not going there. I'm not going that deep. I'm just saying, take notice. Take notice. Uh, for me, it strengthens my faith. Not that I needed it to, but it does. Okay, and this is another example. Take it for what it's worth. Now, I like to color code certain individuals, certain entities, right? I don't do it all the time, but a lot of times I do, and it helps our understanding. I also prefer using the New King James Version, and I mention that in a little footnote from me right here. Note, the New King James Version of the Bible really helps to keep the you, me, he, and him straight, right? Are we talking about a person, a prophet, a disciple, a tribe, a people, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The New King James Version does a great job. It's almost identical to the King James Version. It just will capitalize the Trinity. And it's awesome, and it really helps. And this is another example of it in this study. Now, if you were to ask somebody who doesn't spend any time in the Old Testament, what are the two missions of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, they probably can't answer that question. They'll give some good answers and get part of it right. But if you really want to, if you really want to correctly and professionally, right, professionally, you really want to word it just like the Word of God, you go to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, right, is the prophecy of Jesus and the coming of Jesus and what Father is going to use Jesus to perform and to accomplish during the days of the Lord, also during the early months and years of the millennium. What does Father want Jesus to accomplish? And there's lots of great verses that talk about what Jesus is doing, right, in the New Testament. But if you just want a simple, definite, bam, here it is in two verses. What are the missions of Jesus Christ? And now that we are in the uh, moving into the last days, you could say we're in the last days, but you can only say that if you make it clear to people that the 70th week has not started yet. Because if you just simply say, we're in the last days, people who are don't have as deep of understanding of the Word of God that you have will start saying, yeah, brother such and such says we're in the last days. And they'll say, you know, I agree with him. The first seal, second seal has already been loose. We're probably in the third or fourth seal. I mean, they'll say all kinds of things like that because they really don't understand. So don't add to the confusion by saying we're in the last days unless you clarify it and, and also let the people who are listening to you know that but the 70th week hasn't started yet, right? Until that first seal is loose, the beginning of sorrows hasn't begun. It doesn't matter how much things in the world look like the beginning of sorrows. We're not there yet until the first seal is loose. Amen? How do you know when it's loose? When Israel signs the uh, covenant with death with its evil neighbors and surrounding peoples. At the same time, you'll see the arising of the little horn, the king of the north, the Assyrian, the Bible says. And he shall go forth, and he shall come forth from Nineveh, Mosul, Iraq. Al-Mazil, M-A-W-S-I-L, Iraq, A-L, Al-Mazil, Ma, M-A-W. Now, does that mean Magog? I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? But we do know the Antichrist that shall come forth uh, uh, from Mosul shall be an Assyrian. And how do I know he comes forth from Mosul, this one who plots evil counsel against the Lord, 
who is a wicked counselor to the world and especially Israel? How do I know he comes forth from Mosul? Because the Bible says he does in Nahum chapter 1. And I do believe it's verse 11. 111. And you're going to find the 111 important in this short study. And how do I know he's an Assyrian? Because of Isaiah 14, 25, and Micah 5, 5, as well as other passages. Okay? Like Nahum 1, 11. Hallelujah. So, um, let's look at what the Bible says in Isaiah 49, this great chapter about the prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ, who shall be born of a woman, right? A virgin. All right? And it tells you what Father has for him to accomplish. Hallelujah. So you got the color code straight. Uh, this color is Father. This color represents Jesus, the Son of God. This color represents the tribes of Jacob. And this color represents the Gentiles. Or you could also say the church from the Gentiles. Okay? But the church can also have members within it that are from the original tribes of Jacob. Right? That's common sense. Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 7. Here you go. The prophecy of the coming of Jesus and his missions given to him by Father. If you never knew where it was in the Bible, praise God you do today. Listen, O coastlands, to me. Who is the me? Remember the color coding? This is Jesus. Right Here's the prophet Isaiah writing down what Jesus is saying. But you got to be careful. Sometimes he's writing down what Jesus says. Sometimes he's writing down what Father says. And sometimes he's writing down what God is given him to write in reference to what he sees and hears. You'll see what I mean. Listen, O coastlands, to me, Jesus, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord, this is Father, has called me, Jesus, from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Amen. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me, Jesus, and made me like a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he said to me, this is a small m. The New King James Version, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, always gets this capitalization right. Okay? Now, this is Father talking to the prophet Isaiah in verse 3. And he said to me, right, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, this is Isaiah, Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord, and my work is with my God. Okay? Verse 5. This is, this is the two missions of Jesus Christ given to him by his Father. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant. Now, when this was written by the prophet Isaiah, when he wrote Isaiah 49, had Jesus been born of a woman yet? No, this is a prophecy of a future event. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, right? So this is like Jesus who hasn't been born of a woman yet. He's in heaven, right? This is the word of God. He's talking to the prophet Isaiah, wanting him to write it down. And now this is Jesus telling Isaiah what Father has said. In other words, once Father says something, it's, it's a decree that um, you could take it to the bank. It will be accomplished. When Father speaks it, it is as good as it's already done. This is Jesus talking about what Father has proclaimed, decreed. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, capital S. The New King James Version, when you see S, servant, capitalized, or C, companion, capitalized, or S, shepherd, capitalized, 
You know, that's Jesus. That's not just a, a, a prophet or a disciple. This is Jesus himself, right? This is Jesus talking. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, right? Here we go. This is Jesus saying why Father has formed him. And notice the first thing out of Jesus' mouth is not about the church, right? Which I'm a member of. Say, don't take it personally, but he's mentioning the first flock first. Jesus has two flocks. And on the day of adoption, the day of your blessed hope, the day you receive your crown of righteousness, at his coming at the seventh bowl, last day, that's when Jesus comes. That's when he appears in glory. All right? So, Jesus says, here we go. This is why Father has even made me go to earth to be born of woman and to put on flesh. This is why Father's doing it, right? Even though it hasn't happened yet. It says, who formed me from the womb, right? This is a prophecy, but Father hasn't done it yet. To be his servant, to bring Jacob. So, it's almost like this is what Father, this is a prophecy about what Jesus will say, right, during his ministry. Does that make sense? This is like a prophecy of what Jesus will say, you know, during his ministry or maybe the years leading up to his ministry. In other words, he's an adult. He understands. This is Jesus saying, hey, I've been told by my Father what he has proclaimed, and this is it. Right? So, yeah, you could think of this as a prophecy of what Jesus is going to, did say, at this point, it's future, during his ministry. Two, when you say the two, when you see the two, here we go. Here is the mission to bring Jacob back to him, to turn them back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. Okay? Turn. Israel back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. When will Israel be gathered to him? You need to know when that event is prophesied to take place. It's future. It hasn't happened yet. Israel shall be gathered to him, Father, by Jesus, after Jesus comes the second time. Then Jesus shall take the armies of heaven of Revelation 19 and the great army of Ezekiel 37 to include the reaping angels and to include the mortal ten kings who shall turn against the beast and burn her with fire, these great armies shall be used by Jesus to uproot the beast kingdom throughout the earth and especially the Middle East. And after the Israeli slaves that shall be taken into captivity, slavery, during the war on Israel, that's coming, when the scroll is opened, Jesus, over the period of weeks and months, will recover the remnant, will bring the slaves back to Israel, and Jesus is going to command the nations on all seven continents, if you got any seed line of Jacob members in your country still alive, bring them to me bring them to me. And there's not going to be any with the mark of the beast on them still alive because the reaping angels took care of that probably the first night. Okay? If not the first night, whenever that city gets threshed, they'll get destroyed. So this is after the battle of the great day of God Almighty. This is after the threshing. All the threshing floors have been threshed throughout the world, especially in the Middle East. And now it's time to Whoever's left alive, say, hey, look, I am Jesus. I am the Son of God. You've seen my glory. You've seen my angels. You've seen my immortal family members. You've seen what they can do. You better listen to me. My law is going to go forth from now on. Satan is putting handcuffs, and I'm commanding you now, if you want to live and if you want to have my favor for the next year and even get any rain whatsoever, you better bring me my people. When you bring me my people, Israel, out of your nations, you better treat them with honor and respect. 
like as if every single one of them was a king or a queen and you bring them to me now see that's what Jesus is going to say after the battle of the great day of God Almighty and you can go to Isaiah 11 11 to see that okay now so that's Jesus's first mission and it deals with the first of two folds for I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. So if anyone read the King James Version and thought that that was just Isaiah talking, it's not. It's not. The New King James Version gets the capitalizations right. This is still Jesus talking just like the first part of verse 5. Here we are in the second part of verse 5. Guess what? It's still Jesus talking. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. When? When the Father brings him at the seventh bowl. And my God shall be my strength. And then all, what strength means is you're putting flesh back on. And now you're immortal. Or it could mean strengthening the people of Israel who are in their mortal bodies. Who are unmarked and shall be used by Jesus. To help him rule over the earth. And they'll receive a mortal strengthening. But this is really talking about Jesus' strengthening. Which he's in and now in at that point. An incorruptible body. So there's strengthening to, to the extent of immortality. And then there's also just strengthening of uh, mortal bodies. Now here we go. Verse 6 of Isaiah 49. Still talking about the two missions of Jesus Christ. Indeed, he, Father, says, and I picture Father just, this is me throwing it in there, you know, it is too small a thing that you, my son, should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. So he's basically giving more understanding about mission one, but Father's saying, you know, it's just too small a thing. That that's your only mission. So I'm going to give you another mission. Okay. Where do we see the second mission begin? In verse 6b. The second part of verse 6. You know, after Father had made that statement, you know, it's just too small a thing for me just to give you that mission. So I guess, guess what, my son? I'm going to give you another mission to go along with it. I, Father, will also give you, my son, as a light to the Gentiles that you, Jesus, should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That means all seven continents. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, that's Father. Father's making another statement. To him, now what he's doing is, Father is giving anyone who will listen some clues to who his son is when, he, when his son comes the first time. See, this is back in the days of Isaiah. So Father's going, look, you people of the world, and especially you people in, in the nation of Israel, I'm going to give you clues now to who my son is. So at his first coming, you'll recognize him. To him, my son, who man despises. To him who the nation abhors. That's, that's what, that was Jesus. To the servant of rulers. Kings shall see. Now we're talking, okay, so that identifies who Jesus will be at this point in his first coming. But now the second part of, uh, or I should say, yeah, the second part of verse 7. Now we're going to talk about um, this same son of mine who man despises and who nations abhors, here's what it's going to be like at his second coming. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because the Lord Father who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Okay, so here's Isaiah quoting Father. And Father wants him, Isaiah, to make this statement, and he has chosen you. Okay? The son of Mary. 
So that talks about what it's going to be like at his first coming and what it's going to be like at his second coming. So that's ways Father can identify to people who care who his son is. And there's other ways you could identify who Jesus was at his first coming. Right? There's other ways. Right? The decree. Right? The famous decree of the book of Daniel. And the 69 weeks of seven years from the decree counted down exactly to the week Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, let's go to Ephesians 5, 25 through 26. Again, you're seeing the numbers 5 and 6 in relationship to this subject. Verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing by the word. So here we are again about who the my sanctified ones are. That's a lot of what this subject is, right? Who are going to be the ones who are washed and cleansed? Who are going to be the members of the family of God during the millennium? And you might say, well, in that those two verses, I don't see any mention of the first flock. That's okay. All right, the first flock is mentioned in other places in the Bible, in the New Testament. But here in this uh, two verses in Ephesians, dealing with the my sanctified ones who are going to be cleansed by the washing of water by the word, where uh, the word of God is just strictly emphasizing flock number two. But isn't it interesting that we're still talking about the fives and the sixes? But this is a verse that gives more insight to mission number two, or you could say flock two. Now, here we go. Here's something cool. Romans 15, 16. Again, you see the fives and sixes. That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ. Is that talking about Paul? That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Now, question for you before I give you any more insight on this verse. We know that it's another verse 5 or 6, and it's talking about um, mission number 2, or flock number 2, of Jesus the Messiah. But look what it does. It, it starts making a comment about what's called the offering of the Gentiles. right? If it wasn't for Jesus, the offering of the Gentiles would not be acceptable to Father. Now, when you read, this is what I was talking about earlier, about how you not only want to get understanding of a New Testament passage by the verses before and after it, but you also, if you can find that same subject in the Old Testament, you're going to get tenfold the understanding. And this is the example. What does it mean, the offering of the Gentiles, that might be acceptable to Father? Now, in, Reve uh, in Romans 15, Paul is, is talking about going to Jerusalem. Okay? And he's going to gather up a contribution of those north of Israel. Right in Western Turkey and Greece area and such, and those churches, those those initial churches north of Israel, he's going to put together a, con a con contribution offering so he can take it to the saints that are in Jerusalem. Now, please don't be one of those people who think that that statement alone means that the saints of the Most High are only talking about Jerusalem uh, Christians. That's not the case. The saints of the Most High mentioned in Daniel 7 is the entire church. Okay? And uh, it's the entire family of God. Okay, so the offering of the Gentiles. If you read Romans 15, the whole chapter, you're going to come away with the understanding that we're only, when it says the offering of the Gentiles, 
we're only talking about taking up a little cash offering or maybe gold and taking it too. When Paul goes to Jerusalem, he can put a smile on their face, put them at ease, and so that they would listen to what he has to say and they would accept him with joy because he's bringing them money and being able to feed them and clothe them and meet their needs, okay? So they are gladly accepting and sitting down to hear what he has to say. Now, in regards to the offering of the Gentiles that it might be acceptable, when you go to Malachi chapter 1, especially verse 11, Malachi 1, 1, 1, all right, you get a much deeper meaning of what's known as the offering of the Gentiles. Here's what I have to say. Even though Romans 15 does talk about a contribution offering being taken up to be delivered to the saints that are in Jerusalem, the true meaning of this verse is explained in Malachi 1.11. If people understood the meaning of verse 11, they would have a better understanding of the millennium in Ezekiel 40 through 48. What's Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48? What are those nine chapters that, that shepherds just don't teach in, in church? It's about the millennium. And a lot of it is about the building of the fourth temple and how the sons of Levi are going to offer sacrifices. You're bringing back the grain offerings and the bird offerings and the sin offerings. All these offerings are going to be, in effect, being instituted by Jesus to give a precious honor and praise to his Father. That's what the Bible says. Again, people don't teach it or preach it. But it's in the Bible. And it's also in Malachi 1.11. Okay? It is. You need to read Ezekiel 40 through 48. It gives you the extended borders of Israel during the millennium tells you exactly the dimensions of the fourth temple, not the third temple, tribulation temple. I'm talking about the fourth temple that Jesus and incorruptible, immortal Zerubbabel will lay the foundations of. It'll be built, and there'll be feast of Father celebrated and giving honor to Father that Jesus will lead the worship of during the millennium. And the nations will pilgrimage right? The ones that can will pilgrimage, and they better come, the leaders better come, okay? And they're going to worship Jesus and worship Father, and there's going to be, it's going to be quite the festival, and people are going to eat good. And the valleys, the plush green valleys of Israel during the millennium, or a lot of those valleys are going to be used to raise animals, and they're going to be thousands of animals sacrificed, all right, so the people that come can eat. you got to read Ezekiel 40 through 48 to really understand what Malachi 1.11 is talking about. Let's go to Malachi 1.11. This really isn't, well, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of about, you could say it's kind of about what this subject is about. This is talking about uh, what Father is going to do with the Gentiles. And how they're going to become his family. And then the ones who are still mortal body, in their mortal bodies during the millennium, because they're left alive and they're marked free, even though they didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And they're out there in the seven continents. We don't know how many thousands or millions of people will be left alive, but they're out there. All right. And Isaiah 66, verses 18 through 21, says that Jesus is going to tell those uh, people who are in Armageddon and in Israel and who who are not being destroyed by him when he comes but yet they are mark free he's going to send them back or send them to the nations afar off and the coastlands afar off to tell what they saw about the glory of Jesus and what has happened in the Middle East okay Isaiah 66 so, Malachi 1 starts off with uh, Father complaining about Israel and its offerings and its polluted offerings. You come on, see, polluted offerings. You come on down here to verse 11 of Malachi 1, and there is a brief, a brief mention of what the Gentiles are going to do after Jesus comes during his millennial reign throughout the seven continents. 
And this is one of the few verses in the entire Bible that answers the question, are people left alive on the seven continents going to be making offerings to Father Yah, the Holy One of Israel, in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ? Are they, is it going to be appropriate and highly encouraged and probably commanded by Jesus to take place on the seven continents during Jesus' millennial reign? Right? We're going to have leadership and many people pilgriming, pilgrimaging to see Jesus during the millennium on Father's Feast Days, especially the Feast of Tabernacles. Right, That's a big one mentioned in Zechariah 14 in regards to the millennium. But here in Malachi 1.11, it flat out answers the question about our offerings going to be performed to Father, not to Jesus, to Father in the name of Jesus. You need to know who Father is, right? How do you make an offering to somebody, the God of the universe, if you don't know his name? Right? He's Yah, the Holy One of Israel. You might say Yahweh, Jehovah, Jehovah. The important thing is that you understand he is the Holy One of Israel, the God of the universe. Now look what it says in Malachi 1.11. For from the rising of the sun, in other words, one side of the planet even to its going down on the other side of the planet, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, I say again, in every place, right? From one end of the planet to the other. Incense, this is talking about the millennium, shall be offered to my name. And a pure offering for my name shall be great amongst the nations, right, from one end of the planet to the other, says the Lord. So we're not just talking about uh, the Gentile nations who are left alive, just simply lighting incense. Certain days of the year, they'll bow, give worship to Father Yah, the Holy One of Israel. But it flat out says, and besides the incense, a pure offering. Right? That sounds like an animal sacrifice, the pure. In other words, not, not the, uh, the spotted lamb, not the blind lamb, okay? the spotless lambs, a pure offering. Now, he doesn't say the people can't eat it. Right? He's not saying you got to kill it and then burn it because you all aren't worthy to eat it. That's not what it's saying. I'm not even saying they can eat it or can't eat it. I'm just saying it will be done on all seven continents. Now, that does not give them the excuse to not have the, at least their leadership go to Jerusalem to give honor and glory to Father and His Son, Jesus, okay, in the name of Jesus. Okay, then he goes back to talking more about Israel and how upset Father is with Israel. And if you read Malachi chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, you understand that the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the entire Old Testament, it, it contains four chapters, and it is all about the events that lead up to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the events that happen after the return of Jesus Christ, called, called the Battle of the Great Day of God Almighty, the Wrath of the Lamb, when He un Jesus unleashes at His coming the refiner's fire, all right, on all of His enemies and adversaries. Hallelujah. I hope you like that Romans 15, 16 understanding, brothers and sisters. Now, getting back to these two missions, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you see the 6 again. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's important. So when you're reading chapters like Isaiah 13, right, in reference to the coming, not past, coming fall of Baghdad and its kingdom, its future, Okay, Isaiah 13 talks about the return of Christ, and the chapters that lead up to it, and the chapters following it, are all about the return of Jesus Christ. So don't try to make Isaiah 13 some 
past chapter about King Nebuchadnezzar, because it's not. It's about Lucifer possessing the mind and body of the Assyrian that comes from Mosul, Iraq, that one that plots evil against the Lord, Nahum chapter 111. Brothers and sisters, all of this stuff is in the Bible. I'm not making it up. It's been there the whole time, but yet we struggle. We wrestle, right? Who's, who's going to be Babylon, the great city in the last days? Even though the Bible has told us for thousands of years, it's the city that lies on the Euphrates River that's in the land of Shinar, land of Shishak, land of the Chaldeans. Right? Zechariah 5, Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 51, my goodness, Isaiah 13. Why do we struggle with these basic questions about Bible prophecy? Yes, the final Antichrist is going to be an Assyrian. Yes, Babylon the great city will be Baghdad once again. People go, ah, no way, no way, Baghdad's not that big and powerful anymore. Okay, well, whenever Russia, Turkey, Iran, and, and, and others start building huge command centers in Baghdad, and when the Assyrian sets that image that shall speak and give wicked counsel down on its base in Baghdad, the land of Shinar, says Zechariah 5, oh, it's going to become powerful. And these Israelis that are going to be taken into slavery, one-third of the current population of Israel, says Zechariah 13, will be taken as slaves. And they're going to be used to build up cities like Baghdad. And they're going to be told, you better work quick. You better work quick. Crack goes the whip. Father is sending them into slavery. It's Father's doing. He even claims the Antichrist army in Joel 2. In many other places, Father says, Israel, I just want you to let you know I'm the one doing this. But when I'm done using the Assyrian and his army as a rod of chastisement, I'm going to kill them all. And then their souls are going to lay down in torment forever. Hallelujah. So go to Isaiah 13 and see what's prophesied about the my sanctified ones during the return of Jesus Christ and how they're involved in the fall of the beast kingdom. Acts 26, 18, another six, to open their eyes, the Gentiles, because Acts 26 is all about Paul being sent to the Gentiles, to open their eyes in order to turn them, we're not talking about turning Israel back to God, here we're talking about Jesus' second mission to turn them from darkness to light, right? This is the same light that's found in Isaiah 49, 6, the light to the Gentiles. And from the power of Satan to the power of God. And they may receive, this is Gentiles, may receive forgiveness of sins and, here we go, and inheritance among those who are sanctified. Okay, because Jesus' first flock is going to be sanctified. Jesus' second flock is going to be sanctified. Now, that group of immorals that's going to be following Jesus into battle at Revelation 19, do you understand that a lot of those people on the clouds that's been taken to the barn during the resurrection to life are from the first 4,000 years. A lot of them. I don't know what percentage. And you say, it can't be. That's before Jesus was born of a woman. So, Father still had the book of life. He was putting names in the book of life before Jesus ever walked this earth. I've proven that before in other short studies. Okay, It's called the book of life. It may not be called the Lamb's book of life, but it's called the book of life. He's putting names in it. He sent people off to battle. And he, they and he's promised them, you know, you do what I tell you to do, no matter what it is, even if I say go over there, slay that that group of people in the promised land and don't you leave one person left alive, not even their animals. I mean, however father words it, if they 
And there's men that did that. And they looked forward to the day the Messiah would come, even though they didn't know his name would be Jesus. Father put their names and others, Israelis, in the Lamb's Book of Life before Jesus ever walked the face of the earth. So the sanctified ones are all who are going to be immortal. Now you have the mortal Israelis coming back from slavery, also coming from the seven continents at the order of Jesus in Isaiah uh, 11, 11. And they're going to rule over the planet with their Lord Jesus. And they're going to learn about him and come to the knowledge of who he is, obviously. And then at the great white throne judgment, a lot of them are going to become immortal. But just basic facts like this, we as the church just don't know. And it's a shame. Let's end this study on the My Sanctified Ones and the two missions of Jesus Christ the Messiah. I got a little footnote down here at the bottom. We see in this short study that Jesus has to accomplish by the end of the day of the Lord, which is the seventh bowl, and by the end of the early weeks and months of the millennium. These are the things up here in Isaiah 49 that Jesus must accomplish because his father has given him this mission and jesus is our master right and we serve him and by our serving of jesus we're actually serving father and doing his will but we follow jesus we do whatever he commands us to do hallelujah do we should we are we going to well, brothers and sisters, let's end this short study. I hope you found it a blessing. I'll leave the link to this short study in the narrative or the comment section sometime today. And I'll also leave a link to my 70th week folder alphabetized listing. I've got about 350 or so short studies on the 70th week, all free. It's a safe cloud, keepandshare.com. I hope you'll check it out. Let me know if you disagree or have any questions. Uh, I don't get enough questions, brothers and sisters, until I see you again. God bless.